morning. How are you? Good. I hope by the end of the message you will still say you are very good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because we are looking at the book of Lamentations, right? And、um, if you know, I don't, I don't know whether you know the background to it, but just to give you a bit of historical background, the fall of Jerusalem. This is what Lamentations, the book of Lamentations, is all about. The fall of Jerusalem. What happened? Jerusalem was under siege for over. Two years. What that means is Babylon was the great empire of the time, and they attack Jerusalem. And actually, Jeremiah the prophet had warned them and told them surrender to Babylon. But the king, the priests, the prophets, they refused to listen to Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah, you will see in the book of Jeremiah, you will see it over and over again. Jeremiah warned them, but they refused to listen to God's prophet. Instead, they listened to false prophets. They, the king couldn't decide, and he didn't listen. And then, instead, they decided to make allies with surrounding nations. They tried to ally with Egypt, but then in the end, they failed. And so. Babylon besieged the city of Jerusalem for over two years. What does that mean? That means they surrounded the city and they cut off their food and their water. So, can you imagine a city without food and water for over two years? You can imagine what would happen. That's why when you read the book of Lamentations, first、uh, first chapter, right, the week one, we went through and we saw the devastation. The city was stripped naked because everyone was just grabbing food, whatever they can find, and you will find in chapter four today, it's horrible, it is terrible, and so we see the punishment of Israel in chapter one, and then in chapter two, week two, we looked at. The Punisher. Why did this happen? Because God was the one that punished them, disciplined them. Because we know time and time again they fail to listen to God. And you know God is loving, God is patient, and He is slow to anger. But I think the people of Israel they just did it time and time and time again. And God said, "It's about time." They need to be disciplined. So, because Israel, they broke the covenant, and it was their rebellion and their disobedience that caused the fall of Jerusalem. And you know, when we do wrong, God disciplines. I know we don't like the word discipline, right? No one likes the word discipline、uh, because it always carries a negative effect, right? But God disciplines for our good. Turn to the person and say, "For our good." And you know what? How many of you are parents here? Yeah, yeah. My daughter is here today. I didn't expect her to be here today, but she will listen to this as well. <laughs> as a parent, you would understand. If you're not, if you don't discipline your children, you're not doing your job. And many parents today. They fail. They are too scared to discipline their children. You know, do I like disciplining my children? No. But if I see them going the wrong way, I would say something. If I know that they're not doing the right thing and it's going to harm them, I'm going to say something. I'm now. I'm not talking about when I say discipline. I'm not saying angry parenting, right? And I'm not saying you know the authoritarian way of doing it. No. We as parents. Because for their good, for our children's good, we would teach and instruct them the way they should go. And I don't like doing it. I mean, who? Well, we want to be the good, loving, nice mum, right? You know, always partying, no homework, <laughs> always watching TV, always candy. We want to be the good one, right? But we know if we don't teach them the right way. What's going to happen? They're going to live a life that is meaningless and unpurposeful. Yeah, a mess. It's just a life of destruction, and we wouldn't want that. And you know what? When God sees you walking towards danger, away from Him, He will pull you back. 
He will do all that he can to catch your attention. And you know what? Finally, he got Jerusalem's attention. Now they know. And God is angry. In chapter 2, he says, he was like an enemy to them. And so they're probably thinking, God is angry. Do I still have hope? Everything is so bad now. I've done the wrong thing. Is there hope? Well, thank goodness. Praise the Lord. We have chapter 3. And I think Pastor Irene last week talked to you about that, right? In chapter 3, which is the pinnacle of the book, especially verses uh, 21 to 24, Jeremiah, I think himself, when he saw all that that was happening or happened to Jerusalem, he's probably thinking too, is there hope? Do I dare to hope again? And that's what he's saying. Because in verse 21, he's saying, is there hope? Do I dare to hope? But then Jeremiah, he remembers. He said, despite all that I see now, despite all that that is happening, but I know, verse 21, let's read this together. Lamentations 3, 21. But this I call to mind, and therefore... In the, new, uh, in the New Living Translation, it says, the, I, I still dare to hope when I remember this. So what does Jeremiah remember? We continue, verse 22. The steadfast, read it together. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. He remembers. He remembers that God, who he is, and he says there is still hope. God is faithful. God is kind. God is merciful. God is compassionate. He's loving. He's slow to anger. He is also holy. He's omnipotent, and he is good. And you know, you have to discover who God is, not just know that he is there. A lot of us, we believe in the existence of God, right? Even before I became a Christian, I believed there was a a God. Now today, I don't want you to just believe in the existence of God, but believe him for who he is. You've got to discover who he is. You have to know the reality of who God is. Not who you think he is. Not who you feel he is. A lot of people today have their own concept of who God is. What he looks like. How, how, he, how he acts. No. We have to know God for who he reveals himself to be. Not what you think. And you can only find that out when you read the word of God. That's why we've been telling and urging and encouraging everyone. We have to study the word so we know who God is. You know, when I say God is good, he is good all the time. Not just part of the time. Not just when you think he's good. Not when you feel he is good. Not when good things are happening, God is good. No, despite of everything, anything that is happening, God is still good. Amen. Because that's who he is. The Bible tells us he is good and he does good, despite of how we feel. And the Bible also tells us God is love. So whether you're going through a tough season, or maybe God is doing some pruning in your life, God still loves you. Amen? And God is just. God is holy. He is just. So maybe you are experiencing, you know, bad times. Your enemy, the people that you hate, you don't like, they are getting the upper hand. It looks like, you know, they are winning. Don't worry. God is just. He sees, he cares, and he knows, and he will do something about it. God, we have to know who he is. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So despite of our circumstances, he doesn't change. He doesn't change. And you know, only by reading and feeding ourselves in the word of God, we will know who he is. And you know what? When we read the Bible, there is transformative power. It's not just head knowledge. When you read the Bible, 
when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, there is transformative power. Something changes inside of you. That's why the Bible says your faith will increase. And you will trust in Him. And you will know He is the one who keeps all promises. And that's why we can have hope. Because we know He is the one who is faithful and He keeps His promises. Turn to the person and say, He keeps His promises. You know, someone said this, look at yourself and you will be depressed. And it's true, isn't it? When we look at ourselves, sometimes we get depressed <laughs> because it seems things are not going well, right? Look at circumstances and you'll be distressed. It's true. When we look around us, things that are happening, you get all worked up. But look at the Lord and you will be blessed. And I think we all want to be blessed. So don't look to, you know, yourself, the people, the thing, the problem, whatever it is. Look to the Lord and you will be blessed. And that's what Jeremiah is holding on to. He said, I have to remember this. I call to mind that God is faithful. So can we put our hope in God again? Yes, always, because he never changes. Amen. And this is important. As we go through this book, otherwise it's going to be very depressing, okay? So this week, we're looking at chapter 4. Chapter 4, again, it is an acrostic uh, uh, poem. That means the, the first word begins with the letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So that's why you see there are 22 verses in each book, uh, in, in, in this chapter. And we begin with Lamentations 4.1, again, Jeremiah is looking at the city of Jerusalem and he's thinking, look at this. He says, how the gold has grown dim, how the pure gold is changed. The holy stones lie scattered at the head of every street. The precious sons of Zion worth their weight in fine gold, how they are regarded as earthen pots, the work of a potter's hand. Look, it begins with how the gold has grown dim. They were once precious. They were once people's pride. It was a fabulous, extravagant city, abundant. But now look at it. It's lost all its glory, lost all its beauty. And you know what? That's the effect of sin. Sin makes everything look ugly. Sin devalues everything. But God adds value. God honors. God uplifts. Sin degrades, destroys the ugliness of sin. God has time and time again repeated, he's not going to tolerate deliberate sin. And then look at what Jeremiah then continues to describe what happens to Jerusalem, what is happening. And you know what? Mark this down. He makes a lot of references to Deuteronomy 28. If you remember Deuteronomy 28, it was uh, 28, the curses, the blesses and the curses, right? The blessing and the cursing. If you read Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28, 15 onwards, you will see a lot of similarities of what is happening to Jerusalem and what Moses has said years and years ago. It says here, children, verse 10, the children are now, because they were closed off, right? The children are now begging for food. They are abandoned, uh, Lamentations 4.10. Even, the Bible says, even the most compassionate women boiled their children. Isn't that horror? Even the kindest person will do the most horrific thing. And then it continues, verse 11 to 12. The Lord gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger. He kindled a fire in Zion that consumed its foundations. It says here, it's saying the Babylonians, they came and looted the city. They burnt the walls, the gates, the buildings, the palace, the temple, everything burned to the ground. Go back and read Deuteronomy 28. This is exactly what Moses had warned them about. And then, uh, and then he says, for centuries, right? And then goes the kings, verse 12. The kings of the earth did not believe, 
nor any of the inhabitants of the world that foe or enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. Even the people around Jerusalem, they were surprised. They were thinking, you know, for centuries, God had been protecting the Israelites, had been delivering the Israelites, but now he is pouring his wrath upon them. Even the neighboring nations were shocked at the destruction of this city. But you know what? The people of Jerusalem, they weren't surprised. Because like I said, Deuteronomy already painted a picture. This is what would happen if you disobey God, if you break the covenant. And then, so they are mourning. Not why, because they know why. They've angered God. But they're saying, how? How did all this happen? How did we come to this state? Verse 13. This was for the sins, 13, 4, 13. This was for the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests who shed in the midst of her the blood of the righteous. And this is the, he pinpoints this, Jeremiah, in chapter 4. The captivity was caused by the failures of the leaders. And the king of the time, King Zedekiah, the priests and the prophets. Why? Because they departed from God's law. They neglected to lead the people. You know, as a pastor, and some of you as leaders, that's hard to hear, isn't it? What they were supposed to do, they were supposed to lead the people, they were supposed to heed them, warn them, give them the correct teaching, but they failed to do so. You know, the fall of Jerusalem or the destruction of Jerusalem wasn't a political, wasn't for political reason. It wasn't because they made the wrong, you know, it wasn't, you know, because they didn't make the right allies. It wasn't a militant problem. It wasn't because, you know, they didn't do it strategically enough. It was really a spiritual problem. The fall of Jerusalem was a spiritual problem. Instead of listening to God and seeking God for help, they looked to others. They trusted in the other nations. They trusted in their temple. They trusted in their rituals. Oh, we have to be so careful that you don't trust in your rituals. We have rituals, don't we? We come to church. <laughs> we read our Bible. We do our little devotion. Don't do it just here. Do it wholeheartedly. Seek him with all your heart. Trust in him. Don't do it as a ritual. So the people, because of the leaders, the people fail to see the truth. And even the leaders themselves, they were defiled and blind. Look, we read on. Uh, verse 14. They wandered blind through the streets and they were so defiled with blood that no one was able to touch their garments. Verse 15, away, unclean, people cried at them. Away, away, do not touch. So they became fugitives and wanderers, and people said among the nations, they shall stay with us no longer. Verse 16, the Lord himself has scattered them. He will regard them no more. No honour was shown to the priests, no favour to the elders. Isn't that ironic? Remember the priests, they were so concerned about what's clean and unclean. But now the city is steeped in blood. Dead bodies. They themselves have become unclean. It's ironic, isn't it? So now they're saying to them, you are unclean and people are being scattered. They fail to intercede, to heed warnings to the people. And what happened? The people suffered. And we know in verse 20, the king, in the end, he was captured and he was made blind. Because of this spiritual condition, Jerusalem fell. Because of this spiritual decline, they fell. So my question to you today, I pray, I pray. Because, you know, we are reading and studying the word of God, we are drawn closer to God every day. I don't know whether you've heard of the word biblical literacy. Have you heard of this word? 
biblical literacy, right? It just means basically the ability to read and understand the Bible. And they did a survey. You know, the Bible is so accessible now. We should all be very, you know, biblically literate, <laughs> right? It's so accessible. It's on your phone, it's on your computer, it's on your iPad. You can get it anywhere, anytime. But you know what? People have become biblically illiterate even so much more now. They did a survey. They haven't done one in Hong Kong, but I don't think it'll be any different. It may be even worse. <laughs> People have access to the Bible, but they're not really studying or, or reading the Bible at all. And you know, these are not the same thing, right? Uh, they say in the US, 87% of the households, they have a Bible. 87%. But, yes, but only 11% would actually pick it up and read it. And then they did this among Christians. 40% of Christians, uh, and only, only 40% of Christians read the Bible outside the church. So on a Sunday, only on a Sunday. 40%. And that's quite scary, isn't it? Biblical literacy is on the decline. And you know, if we neglect the Word of God, the spiritual disciplines, our spiritual lives become powerless. We become weak. And you know, we are spiritual beings. We need spiritual nourishment. That's why you will understand why Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus knew. Actually, he's just repeating what Deuteronomy said, right? We don't live on bread alone, not just material things, that things that make us physically healthy. We need spiritual nourishment. Otherwise, you're going to be spiritually malnourished. And when that happens, you will start feeding on other things. And they are carnal and fleshly things. They are the things that are no good for you. And then we fall right back into sin, spiritual decline. That's why, you know, for, you know, we all, I don't know, you've heard this phrase said before, right? The problem of the heart, I mean, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart, right? It's our heart. And that's why Proverbs says, you know, everything, we have to guard our heart because the flow, from it flows the spring of life. And then he also reminds us, love your Lord, your God, with all your heart. So what's filling you up today? Is it the love of God and your love for God? Because look what happens when people fall away from God. It's disastrous. And it's interesting. In, I'm going to end soon. In, it's interesting because in this chapter, he mentions three places. One is Zion or Jerusalem. And that's the, you know, the main character of the whole book of Lamentations, right? But then he also mentioned two other places. And it's interesting he mentions that. One is Sodom and the other one is Edom. Sodom, in verse 6, he says, For the chastisement of the daughter of my people, Lamentations 4, 6. For the chastisement of the daughter of my people has been greater than the punishment of Sodom which was overthrown in a moment, and no hands were wrung for her. Well, that's pretty, if you, go, if you don't know what happened to the city of Sodom, go back and read Genesis 19 to 20, okay? But if you remember the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, you will know God destroyed that city like that because they were lawless. They were so sinful. And, 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 and here... Jeremiah is saying, hey, you are worse than that. <laughs> worse than the city of Sodom. And what was the sin of Sodom? If you read the book uh, in Genesis 19 to 20, you will find, uh, 18 to 20 actually, you will find out it was mainly, they were, they were very sexually perverted. There was a lot of adultery, a lot of sexual sins. And it was a city of just lawlessness. And if you remember, Abraham tried to intercede for them. He begged God. He deal. He tried to, you know, talk God out of it. He said, God, if there are 50 righteous in that city, will you destroy them? 
And he said, no, I won't. And then Abraham, I think he knew how sinful they were. And he said, how about 40? God said, okay, if they are 40, I won't. So he goes down, he goes, how about 30? How about 20? And he goes down to 10. He said, God said, if there are just 10 righteous in that city, I will not destroy Sodom. But you know what happened? <laughs> there were less, less than 10. So the city was destroyed completely. And what Jeremiah here is saying, the city of Sodom was destroyed. And he's saying, hey, your punishment is even greater. Sodom was destroyed like this, but now you guys are starving to death. The suffering was long and painful. You know, I know today we're looking at the word and said, it's the priests and the leaders and so on. But you know what? Yes, of course, as leaders, we have to be so, so careful. But you know what? The Bible also says, every one of you, you are the royal priesthood. First Peter chapter 2, 9, he says that once you were not a people of God, but now you are God's people. Every one of you. We have been entrusted with the message of the gospel. We all have been entrusted with the word of God. I pray that today, you know, that we will speak out the truth. We will speak out the truth. Not just the uh, truth, by truth, I mean the word of God. You know, so many people today speak out. They just speak out anything. They want to vent their anger or whatever. No, not just speak out, but speak out the truth. The word of God. Because, you know, there are so many practices around the world right now that is against biblical teachings. You know that, right? And we just talked about Sodom. Sodom, their main sin was adultery and sexual perversion. And today, if we think Sodom was bad, are we any better? I don't know. If you look around what's happening around the world, I don't know whether we're any better. I mean, we see sex before marriage is okay now, right? It seems everyone thinks it's normal. We are out fashion. We are old fashioned. Sex outside of marriage. Adultery, divorce is on the high. And even, you know, same sex, casual sex, all these things seem normal now. That's the scary thing. We seem to be the abnormal one. That's the scary thing. So today, let us be more concerned, you know, be the salt and light. I think that's what I'm trying to say. We've been called to be a church, to be salt and light in the city. So let ourselves first be taught by the word, live out the word so that we can speak out. We can be able to teach, we'll be able to warn, we'll be able to encourage others. Speak out the truth. As a church, be the salt and light. Pray for the city. Pray for the people around you. The series is called Healing a Broken World. How are we gonna heal the broken world? Like Jesus, he came for the sick and the lost. Let us go to the people that are in need. And then lastly, he talks about the sin of Edom. Right, quickly, he mentions Edom. Now Edom, we know they are descendants of Esau. And Jacob and Esau, they were brothers, but they were fighting all the time. And this happened even to their descendants. So they were, you know, even though they're brothers, but they don't, you know, they don't, they don't stick out for each other. And this is what happened. Some have argued during the fall of Jerusalem, Edom actually helped Babylon. But some say they didn't help, but they did nothing. They watched their brothers burn. In uh, Obadiah 1.11, it says, On the day that Jerusalem was destroyed, you stood aloof. Meaning you did nothing. You just watched your brothers suffer. And in Psalms 137, even said, they boasted, they were happy. And that's why in Lamentations 4.21, it says, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, you who dwell in the land of Uz. But to you also the cup shall pass. You shall become drunk and strip yourself bare. 
It says, Rejoice and be glad, Edom. You may laugh now for the fall of Judah. But you know what? The same is going to happen to you. That's what it's saying. And your sins will be exposed as well. You will be punished as well. So you know, today, for us, don't rejoice at your enemy's loss. I know, I know. Sometimes, yes, evil does exist and people do fail. And, and some people, we think they deserve it. But you know what? Don't be too proud. Don't boast. Be compassionate. Be kind. Jesus came for that very reason. He came for the lost and the sick, right? And so today, don't be too proud or quick to judge. Don't become self-righteous when we see our brothers fall. So as a church, we should exemplify Jesus. Don't add to the hate. Don't add to the argument, but instead show compassion. That's why Jesus said, love your enemies. Forgiveness is important. And don't rejoice when they fall, because otherwise we are no better than the Pharisees. Because that's what the Pharisees did, right? They were so concerned about their own purity, their own holiness, that they neglected, they they boasted their own kind of self-righteousness, that they neglected the needy, the poor, the widow, the people that truly are in need. And then what did Jesus call them? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. Let us not be hypocrites. You know, a lot was said today, and I think today, I don't know what you heard. There was a lot to that message, right? But I'm just going to ask Pastor Mokwan, but time is almost up. Pastor Mokwan to come and just to pray for us. Pray for the leaders. Pray for every one of us so that we can be so and light in this city. That we don't add to the spiritual decline. We proclaim revival in this city. Amen? We proclaim revival in Taiwan. <laughs> 